Let's get started this morning. Let's pray. Lord, you have given us your word for our edification, for our instruction. And we pray that as we open it up again this morning, that you would help us to understand how it is that we ought to live together in the house of God as we seek to build one another up and live out a a testimony to the world around us. We pray that you would make clear to us what your word teaches and what you would have us to do in response. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we began a a new series last week on the pastoral epistles. So today we're continuing that by looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, if any of you are familiar with 1 Timothy 2, you know that we're going to have quite a bit to talk about this morning. So, uh, we've already seen that in the pastoral epistles, Paul is giving instructions to young pastors as to how they ought to lead their churches, how those churches ought to operate. And what we find here in the the second chapter of 1 Timothy includes some of those kinds of instructions. The main focus of the chapter is on prayer and its its role in the church and the, the way that members of the congregation should be involved in the ministry of prayer. So, let's dive right into it, shall we? 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to take this a piece at a time. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified, in every way. Paul begins dealing with this issue of prayer by answering the question, for whom should we pray? What kind of an answer does he give to that question? Very broad, (laughs) very broad, yes. What's he say here? Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. For kings are all who are in high positions and may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now, when he says to pray for everybody, what what does that mean in practice? Um, it, it, are we dealing with something here like God bless the missionaries? You know, just some some broad, vague, general statement. How, how is it possible to do what Paul's talking about here? It's not. Phil, it's not, okay. Well, then why does Paul say it? <laughs> it because what he's not saying is that, yes, this can't be done, but with the leading of the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit, yes, of course it can be done. God, God requires us to do many things that we can't do, but we can do them in the oh. Holy Spirit. Okay, so in our own strength, this can't be done, but in the Holy Spirit, it can be. Yes. All right. John? I don't think he's saying open up a, well, not that people have phone books, but pray for every single person in the world. He's saying pray for all kinds of people. And specifically, um, um, he's giving an example of those who, who might not want to pray for, those people that are in authority, um, things like that, but all kinds of people for the CIA. Okay. Often you encounter this in scripture where the the use of the term all is uh, not intended to be universal in the sense of every single individual, but referring to all kinds of individuals. Okay. And when he does get a little specific later on, it's clear that he is talking about that sort of thing. All right. Other thoughts? That no one is excluded from, you know, no, you wouldn't come across anyone. Okay, so there, there's, there's no one who would not be a suitable candidate 
for the prayers of believers. There's no one you would say, oh, I shouldn't pray for that person. I shouldn't pray for this situation. OK, Dawn? <laughs> I don't like them. I don't like their rule. I don't like what they're doing. So I'm not praying for them. So okay. So All right. I think he might be like hitting that right on the head where it's like, nope, you're praying for them too. All right. So we, we have a situation here where on the, on, on the one hand, you, you can't leave out people that you would be disinclined to pray for because you dislike them. Prayer is a form of loving your enemies, praying for them, OK? And it's also true that there are no such thing as people who don't need prayer, OK? I think if you, if you look at this in, in general terms, one of the things that Paul's trying to get across is that our prayers should go beyond our own personal immediate concerns. I think that the tendency that we have most often when we pray is to focus on my immediate needs or those close to me or those I know personally. And with that kind of focus, certainly that's a good thing. We ought to be praying those things. But Paul wants to make sure that we extend our prayers beyond the range of our immediate concerns and immediate contacts and recognize that there are much broader needs in the world that we ought to be ought to be thinking about when we pray. And then he, he gets on, gets a, a little more specific, talking particularly about prayer for kings and all who are in high positions. Context helps here. When Paul's talking about praying for kings, who's he talking about? Caesar, Caesar the Caesar at this time was Nero. OK. Nero was the Roman emperor at this point. Uh, at the time that Paul was writing 1 Timothy, the Neronian persecutions had not yet begun. That wasn't going to show up for another year or two. But Nero was already beginning to show signs of instability. So and there's, there's no way in which you could look at Nero as someone being a positive influence in the Roman Empire or certainly friendly to Christians. And yet, Paul says, we ought to be praying for him, praying for others in high positions as well. Well, you get to others in high positions. What kinds of encounters did Paul tend to have with people in high positions in the course of his missionary journeys? He faced persecution from Jewish religious leaders. He ran into some difficulties with local governors and rulers and places where he traveled. There were some conversions, yes, but there were also some difficulties with persecutions. So Paul had not, in general, had tremendously positive experiences with political leaders. And yet he says, you ought to be praying for these people. Now, obviously, when you pray for those in authority, you would pray for the conversion of those who, who weren't saved. But what else should we be praying for those who are in authority? OK, so it's, 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 legitimate, it's legitimate to pray that the government will leave the church alone. <laughs> yes. uh, obviously, there have been many times in the history of the church where that hasn't been the case. There are many places in the world today where that's not the case. We've experienced some of that in our own country with some of the, uh, the, the lockdowns in various states and things of that nature, with some of the uh, decisions that have been made by various courts. It's appropriate to pray that 
the, the government would simply leave the church alone to do the task that God has, has required. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be any persecution. Jesus made it clear that there would be. But it's also appropriate to pray that it not, that it not happen. And so prayers for rulers would include not only their salvation, not only that they would make decisions that would be according to God's will, even though that may not be their motives for doing so. And we've certainly seen some of that. But also that they would govern in such a way that the church would be free to, uh, to worship and to practice what God has commanded. So, very, very broad starting point here. Okay, Pray for everybody. <laughs> and that obviously means a, a lot of different things. Now, having talked about for whom we should pray, he now moves on in the next couple of verses to talk about why we should pray. So pick it up in verses 3 and 4. We are in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, for those who just came in. Verses 3 and 4. This is good. It's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why we should pray? Because it's good and pleasing in the sight of God. Now, why is it that God desires us to pray? It implies that he uses our prayers. OK. There's, there's an implication here. And I was going to bring that particularly out in connection with verse 4, that God uses our prayers as a way of accomplishing his purposes in the world. Uh, obviously, salvation is the work of God. God is sovereign in the work of salvation. He's the one who saves people. We don't save people. And yet, God uses instruments in his work of salvation. He uses means, and those means include the preaching of the word. They, they include the testimony of believers. They also include prayer. And so when he says in verse 4 that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, he connects this with the prayers of believers, that God wants you to pray for the salvation of those who don't know you, and that furthermore, these prayers become a means by which God accomplishes the salvation of sinners. Yeah, John? Um, just the very essence of prayer just points to the fact that Phil, Phil mentioned it before, that prayer glorified God. It's at its very basis, it just points to the fact that we cannot do it on our own, that God has to be the one to initiate the change. So it all points to Yeah, prayer is pleasing in the sight of God because it demonstrates dependence on God and therefore gives glory to him. Right. It also Will. Shows, shows an activeness of our faith. Because if, if, if praying is when we bring our burdens and our cares before the Lord of glory. OK. All right, so, so prayer is a means of putting faith into action. Because if we trust God, we will bring our concerns to him. We will put our, our requests before him, trusting that he is going to hear and respond. So it's a way of putting faith into practice. Good. Now, one thing we need to look at here is that verse 4 in particular sometimes gets misused. He desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? Now, 
the passage, the, the, the verse gets misused in a couple of different ways. Some of you are smiling knowingly. You know where, know where this is going. What do I have in mind here? OK, one of the ways this gets misused is by universalism. There are those who say, if indeed God desires all people to be saved, can God's will possibly be thwarted? If God desires all people to be saved, surely God's desires will be fulfilled. And so sometimes this verse is used to support a universalist understanding of salvation. Clearly, anybody who does that has not read the rest of the Bible. They, the, the scriptures do not contradict themselves. And the Bible has an awful lot to say about those who are not saved and will not be saved. So you're, you're lifting things completely out of the context of the scriptures as a whole when you do that. But this is a proof text that universalists sometimes use. John, what were you going to say? Okay. All right. So, if universal salvation were God's intent, there'd be no point in praying for the salvation of people because everybody's going to be saved anyway, right? Okay. Yes, Kelsey. It gets misused by like inconsistent Arminians too. So they'll say, "Well, God desires all people to be saved, <clears throat> so therefore." Calvinism can't be true because God wants all people to be saved, but then they have this free choice, and that's why some people aren't saved. So that kind of thing. All right. You, you also find the passage being misused from an Arminian perspective because people say if God desires all people to be saved, he must therefore have made it possible for all people to be saved, which means that the ultimate decision is theirs, which... As, as we know, ultimately reduces salvation to salvation by works because it's dependent on the decision of the individual. Yeah, Jerry. I think there's a significance in verse 3 and also in 1 Timothy 1, 9. I'm sorry, it's uh, where, where Paul mentions God, our Savior. It's not mentioned many times that way. Maybe five or six, or maybe not even five in the New Testament. God, our Savior. He doesn't say the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. He says God, our Savior. And I think that that, you know, he also says to, to he was immortal, invisible, uh, the all wise God, you know, be glory and honor. It's all about God's choice. You know, he chose what to do, and nobody can thwart his will, certainly. And if he chooses to save some, God, our Savior, he's God. And I, I think it's significant that Paul calls him God, our Savior. You know, in, in Acts 20, 28, it says that it was God's own blood that purchased. So I think there's significance to those three words that Paul uses there. Yeah, I, the, the, the sovereignty of God is something that Paul emphasizes repeatedly throughout his epistles. And yeah, re referring to God in these terms certainly points in that direction. Well, what we have here is language that's similar in a lot of ways to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's flip there for a minute. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. <clears throat> Similar language, but when Peter is speaking there in, in 2 Peter 3, he's speaking in the terms of the coming judgment which makes it clear that we're not talking about universal salvation here. But uh, rather, it's a, it's a warning that judgment is coming. So we, we have a situation in these verses that we are, we are to pray 
because it pleases God, because God uses our prayers. And in particular, uses them in, the, in his work of saving those who are lost. Now, the next question that Paul addresses as he goes through this chapter is, on what basis should we pray? Let's pick it up in verse 5. For there's one God, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Now, what's, what's the connection? Verse 5 begins with four. So what, what has gone before, Paul is saying, all of this is true, all of this is something you should do because there's one God and one mediator, et cetera, et cetera. What's the connection? Why is the command to pray and his discussion of prayer in the first four verses dependent on what we see in verses five through seven? Go on. Why, why is the mediatorial work of Christ an essential basis, an essential foundation? Okay, so we know that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray even when we don't know how to pray, and that Christ is the one through whom our prayers become acceptable to God. All right, Don? All right, so the, the mediatorial work of Christ is essential not only in prayer. Right? Prayer works, so to speak, because we pray to, to God the Father in the name of Christ, and he's the one who brings our prayers before the throne of God. And it's because of Christ's mediatorial work that those prayers are heard. But the mediatorial work of Christ is also essential in the work of salvation. If it, if it were not for the death of Christ, and Paul focuses on that, right? Who gave himself a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. So it's the work of Christ on the cross that enables him to be the mediator that enables people to stand before God to receive God's, God's saving grace. So he's a mediator for salvation. He's a mediator for prayer. Other thoughts? Rick? You might be you might want to you might do all of this when you get to your applications, I don't know, but um, given the mediatorial identity that that uh, Paul gives to Jesus here, um, and spelling that out, lets us know that even our prayers for those who are in authority is not simply self centeredness. It's not simply for our prosperity. It's not simply so that the economy goes well or so that there is no violence or there's no um, injustice. Those are all important things to pray for, but it has to do very much with redemption. And so we're praying, even our prayers, in regard to um, uh, the authorities that there are, uh, circle around to this matter of the Redeemer of Christ and his mediatorial work of, of salvation. Um, in other words, the big picture needs to be kept in mind and, and not reduce uh, 
uh, are praying even for authorities into a self-centeredness, into something that's concerned about us and our personal welfare, but uh, has to do with the gospel. Okay, so when you're, you're dealing with the issue of prayer, even the prayers regarding authorities, the, the focus needs to be on the work of the gospel, the spread of the gospel, not only the salvation of rulers, but an environment where people are turning to Christ. Now, of course, we recognize that God's work of salvation is often accomplished in the context of times of trouble. And so while on the one hand it's entirely appropriate to pray that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, okay, godly and dignified in every way, we can be peaceable in times of trouble. We can be godly and dignified in times of trouble. And God often uses those times of trouble to bring people to himself. And so that mediatorial work of Christ and salvation is something that is to be the, the, the focus of our, of our prayers because the, the gospel is what it's all about. The, the growth of God's kingdom is what it's all about and God accomplishes that by many different means. Phil, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, I don't know if this is true, but if this is true that angels don't pray, that would be a common sense thing. Don't pray, you don't have a redeemer, there is no hope for you, you know, thinking of demons. But with us, we're redeemed. So it, I like things that make sense. It makes sense that we pray. Why would they pray? <laughs> like, God's mad at them. There's nothing they can do. If God's mad at me. Why bother with them? Just, just uh, don't bother. <laughs> Take your licking. Okay, so the, the need for prayer is associated with the work of redemption from our perspective as well. It's because we've been redeemed that we're able to go through Christ as mediator. Uh, angels and demons aren't in that kind of situation. Okay, fair enough. Okay. God uses prayer not only to change circumstances, not only to change people, but also to change the prayer, the person who's doing the praying. Yes. This is all kind of been said already, but to, to dovetail, uh, there's a separation between God and, and, and us. Um, we, we cause the separation. Um, I think in the unbelieving mindset, there. That concept isn't it isn't a, it isn't an issue. Why why should I be a mediator? God's cool with me. Me and God are cool with each other. But um, but as, as soon as as soon as we're saved, we realize no, there was a there was a separation there, and, and we need a mediator. So it's it's just highlighting the fact that you know unbelievers don't don't think they need a mediator. It's it's not a relevance. Okay, the, the, the acknowledgement that a mediator is needed is at the same time an acknowledgement of sin, an acknowledgement of separation, a separation that needs to be bridged, right? Now, there are some ways in which Christ is a mediator that we didn't bring, bring up. We hit, hit several of them. He's a, a mediator in prayer. He's a mediator in salvation. He is a mediator also because he has ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's a mediator in the sense that he fulfills all of the, the theocratic offices of the Old Testament. There were three major theocratic offices in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings. And all in one sense or another were mediators. The prophets were mediators because they spoke God's word to man. The priests were mediators because they presented the people's offerings to God. The kings were mediators because they ruled as God's representatives enforcing his law. 
and Christ fulfills all of those mediatorial offices, bringing God's word, offering the prayers of God's people, okay? ruling from heaven, from his throne. So we, we find that there are many, many different ways in which Christ serves as a, as a mediator. Now, again, we encounter the, the same difficulty of interpretation that we did before, and that is the, the reference in verse 6 to who gave himself a ransom for all. Did Christ die for everybody? Obviously, you're here again encountering the whole Calvinist Arminian thing. How do you interpret this statement that Christ gave himself as a ransom for all? As, as scripture also says, you know, the call is given to all people. God's, Jesus' intercessory uh, dying on the cross is sufficient for all, but efficient. Okay, there are a couple of different reformed interpretations of the passage. We've actually hit them both. Uh, one, one is the one that, that Will was talking about, that the death of Christ was sufficient for all, efficient for the elect. That had God decided to save everybody, nothing more would have needed to be done other than the death of Christ. His work on the cross was sufficient for all and yet only those who were chosen by God were the, the beneficiaries of it. And of course, the, the statement that was made earlier in the class, talking about all as a reference to all kinds of people rather than to each individual specifically. Remember, in the New Testament, you are always dealing with the Jewish Gentile issue. It, it is not something that is as directly addressed in the pastorals as it is in Paul's other epistles. But it's, it's a constant presence in the background of the writing of the New Testament. And so Paul always wants to make it clear, both the Jew and the Gentile are included in God's plan of salvation. All right, now. Let's get to the second half of the chapter, which is where a lot of the controversy arises if we haven't hit enough already. Mm. Uh, real quick Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we didn't have time to go into all of the, the background proof texts that would support a Reformed understanding of the biblical doctrine of Scripture. But what you're saying is certainly true, whether you're dealing with the doctrine of, of man or the doctrine of God or the doctrine of salvation, all of it fits together into one picture that salvation is the work of God and not in any way a synergistic thing where God and man each contribute their own part. Okay, now, as I said, here things get controversial. So, uh, what we find then at the, the end of the chapter is Paul dealing with the question of how we should pray. So let's pick it up at verse eight. I desire then that in every place Men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Um, Paul has, does, does this, this with some frequency. When he's dealing with men and women issues, he has a little bit to say about the men and a lot to say about the women. Um, he does it again here. But what, what he says about the men is something to which we should pay attention because he packs an awful lot of content into this one verse. In every place, men should play, pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Okay. 
Again, there's a universal aspect to this in every place. Prayer is not something that's restricted to a particular place. Prayer isn't just something that you do in church. In their context, prayer is not something, if you're Jewish, not something you do in the synagogue. Prayer is something that is to be done in every place. Uh, elsewhere, Paul makes it clear that prayer is to be done at any time. He tells the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Uh, is Paul specifying a posture here? I mean, when, when, when we pray, should we be doing this? Amen. Should be doing this. <laughs> But aside from the wisecracks, does anybody have a thoughtful <laughs> response? <laughs> no. I don't know if this is right, but it, it just seems like that's connected to the quarreling thing. Uh, the hand signals is connected to, I don't want you quarreling. Well, one, one of the bizarre aspects of this, of course, is that people have quarreled over this question of posture, <laughs> of posture in prayer. <laughs> Which wasn't quite what Paul had in mind. Yes, well. I think it's more of a posture of the mind and soul where, where we're not going before God quarreling and angry because of the situation. And we're, we're holding out our hands expecting an answer. Okay. So the, the posture that he describes here is one that points to God, makes God the focus, means that we are coming before him expectantly. BJ? Um, it reminds me of Psalm 24. It says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear to see. So lifting holy hands is Okay, so you deal, you're dealing with pure hands, hands that have been purified by the mediatorial work of Christ. Okay, yeah, Don? Um, I don't know if this has connection or not, but it, it reminds me of in the Old Testament when Moses was praying for the people, um, the people were fighting, and he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Okay. All right, the Israelite battle with the Amalekites where Moses is up there on the mountain and Aaron and her are holding his hands up so the Israelites keep winning, okay? Now, this isn't about posture. You go through the scriptures. There are passages that talk about prayer while standing, while kneeling, while bowing, while prostrate on the ground, while sitting. There are passages that refer to all of these different postures. Strangely enough, the one that is most, uh, most typical in our culture, bowing your head and folding your hands and closing your eyes, isn't mentioned at all. <laughs> so <laughs> the point is not posture. The point is the heart. And all of these different descriptions in one way or another point to the kind of heart attitude that we should have when we're coming before God. Now, Paul's concerned not only about the attitude of heart that we bring before God in prayer. He's also concerned about the attitude toward one another with which we come, come to prayer, okay, without anger or quarreling. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? You come before God in prayer and realize that your brother has something against you. Okay, Stop make things right with your brother, then bring your gift. And so uh, one's attitude toward God is important in prayer also. One's attitude toward one another. You need to be right with your brothers because prayer, particularly in the context of the church, which is what Paul's dealing with, 
is a form of fellowship. We, we pray together. We pray for one another. That's why we describe someone engaged in public prayer as leading in prayer, because that prayer is supposed to be something in which all are participating while one is voicing it. All right. Now, the rest of the chapter, Paul deals with the, the role of women in worship. Uh, clearly, this was a controversial issue in the first century, uh, as much as it is today, certainly. Uh, and of course, the, the difficulty that we encounter is that Paul's words have often been twisted to make them say exactly the opposite of what they do indeed say. So we need to look at this with a little bit of care. Pick it up, verse 9. Likewise also, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now, he talked about how men should pray. Now he's talking about how women should pray. Um, what's the nature of the prohibitions that Paul gives here? Elliot? Caring so much about our physical appearance that we don't care about our spiritual appearance to God. All right. So uh, again, there's this external, internal thing going on that people who come before God in prayer should not be doing so with concern about their, their outward appearance, uh, but desire to impress others, that sort of thing. OK? Like not drawing too much attention to yourself. OK. So when, when you pray, the attention should be drawn to God and not to yourself. That is a fairly persistent problem in prayer, and it's certainly not something by any means restricted to females. Uh, probably is more often encountered when dealing with, with men when they pray. Uh, there are all kinds of ways in which people can draw attention to themselves when they pray rather than drawing attention to God. Um, yeah, I don't don't want to get into a list here, but the, the list could be fairly substantial, whether it's the, the kind of language that you use or certain uh, phrases or unnecessary repetitions or all, all kinds of ways in which people can draw attention to themselves. Uh, people can draw attention to themselves by preaching many sermons while they're allegedly praying. <laughs> Just all, all kinds of things. You were going to say something, Tom. I'm just going to ask a question. Um, given that he's talking about how women appear, um, has Paul moved to a corporate setting in, um, in his instruction here? Is it, I mean, um, the whole point of, I guess, of braiding your hair uh, and adorning yourself with gold and pearls and costly garments is to be seen by others. So. It seems like he's moving into a, a corporate, more like a church type or a place of worship setting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, De is definitely operating in a corporate setting here. I think, well, to a large extent, the whole book is. But yeah, yeah, he, he definitely has in mind how the church ought to behave when they gather together. Well. All right, so uh, avoiding emphasizing class distinctions in the congregation by the way people dress. Uh, the sort of thing that uh, James goes into, for instance, in, uh, in, in James 2, where he, he talks about 
Yeah. Now, some of you sit in the best seats and tell the poor guys to go sit on the floor. You know, you, 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 the church doesn't operate that way. Class distinctions don't exist in the body of Christ. Yeah, BJ. Okay, one, one of the major difficulties that people have encountered in connection with this passage is where Paul is emphasizing not making external appearance an issue. People have used the passage precisely to focus on exterior, uh, external appearance by requiring, for instance, plain clothing. It, it, accomplishes exactly the opposite thing that Paul is trying to accomplish. He doesn't want people to worry about how they're dressed or what they look like. That should not be an issue. And yet, in, in various kinds of churches over the years, it's become exactly that kind of an issue because of certain prohibitions and requirements that have even been based on this passage. And well, you're, you're not holy unless you dress this way. And Paul's point is completely the opposite. What constitutes an appropriate way of coming before God is a, a whole life, godly, godly living. All right, moving on. Verse 11, let a woman learn uh, quietly with all submissiveness. Mm. Some of you have been contributing in Sunday school this morning. Is that a bad thing? Is, is Paul prohibiting that? <laughs> I, <laughs> yes, I, I tried to draw a further comment from you. <laughs> uh, what's the point? All right, so Paul uses general language. All rulers, all prayer, everywhere, all times. Uh, I mean, he's, he's using language like this throughout the passage. OK, the whole passage uses all kinds of generalizations. All right. OK. 
Okay, I mean, here's, here's another situation where drawing attention to oneself is something that can very easily be done. Uh, this is not intended as an absolute prohibition that women are never to open their mouths. That becomes obvious, for instance, when you look at a passage like 1 Corinthians 11.5, where it talks about women speaking out in church. It's the, this is the context of talking about praying. So it's not an ab demand for absolute silence, but it has to do with the way in which the speech occurs, the way in which the prayer occurs. That is not to draw attention to oneself, it's to be submissive, submissive to God, submissive to authority, which he then makes clear in the next verse. And of course, the next verse is the one that generates much of the controversy in this passage. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Well, this tells you something about the kind of quietness that, that he's talking about here. And it has to do with exercising authority over the men in the congregation. The particular functions that are described here. Okay, to teach or to exercise authority. Those are the functions that are associated in scripture with what? Male with male leadership, more specifically with? Elders. With the eldership, yeah. Yeah, the, these are, are the functions that are associated with the, uh, with the eldership. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.17 talks about it in those terms. Teaching and ruling are the functions of elders. And so what we have here is the clearest prohibition in the scripture of female ordination. Now, those who argue in favor of it, and that's increasingly become a, an issue, not only in liberal churches where it's no longer an issue, it's so widely accepted, but more and more evangelical churches are moving in this direction as well. How do you make this verse say exactly the opposite of what it says? Well, typically, and we, we don't have time to open this up and get into a lot of discussion of it, but typically the way it works is to say, well, we are dealing here with some kind of culturally conditioned situation. You take the extremes on one hand. Paul was a male chauvinist pig. <laughs> this was Paul's opinion. We don't have to take it seriously. Or this was first century patriarchy. Therefore, we don't have to take it seriously. Those who would try to sound perhaps a bit more scholarly would argue, well, what's going on here is some particular problem that existed in the Ephesian church. They had a bunch of loudmouth women in the Ephesian church. And so Paul's prohibition has to do with the specific situation that he's addressing in the specific church to which he's writing. Now, what's the problem with all of those attempts to explain away this verse? There's two problems. First, we don't know a lot of those things that they would just be speculating. They would say, this must have been a problem in this church, so this must be him addressing this. But we don't know that there were a lot of mouth women in the Ephesian church. <laughs> Oh. by saying this must have been cultural, so I don't have to love my neighbor because obviously they were doing this then, and that really doesn't apply now. OK, so on, on the one hand, you have had the issue that cultural explanations are purely speculative. There's no evidence that such cultural situations existed. Secondly, if you were to follow that hermeneutic consistently, it would allow you to dismiss just about any teaching in the New Testament. One that, one that people like to point to is, well, what about head coverings? You know, pe uh, people, if, if you're not a Mennonite, are generally in agreement that, that uh, he was dealing with a cultural issue there. So ladies, you don't have to wear hats to church. Uh, so, well, if that one's cultural, why can't this one be cultural too? Uh, you, you, you run into all those kinds of problems, makes it very easy to dismiss it. But there's a really obvious reason here 
why the cultural explanations simply do not work. Elliot, what are you thinking? All right, so the teachings in the chapter so far have all been universally applicable to churches and Christians everywhere. And there's no reason why you should suddenly dig into, without any indication, dig right into something that's going on in Ephesus. Come on, we're, we're, we're missing the obvious here. Dan? Paul brings that home in the next verse where he talks about it. Yeah, there's no need to speculate about the reasons why Paul says this, because he tells us the reasons why he says it. Continuing, four, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. This was not based on Paul's personal prejudices. It was not based on the first century Roman Empire. It was not based on what was going on in the Ephesian church. It is based on creation and, and the fall. Okay. Uh, the, the universal foundation for the prohibition that's given here is something that Paul wants to make very, very clear. And so the, the idea that leadership in the church should be male leadership, he grounds it in creation and fall. Men and women were intended by God to fulfill very different and equally vitally important roles. That's true in the family. It's true in the church. And so Paul makes sure that his readers understand that what he's saying here is not culturally based, but rather is grounded in the, the fundamental nature of the world that God has created and the fundamental nature of a fallen human race. Now. What about the last verse? Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. What does that mean? It's faith reformed Baptist that's really okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we tend to do well in the childbearing area, yes. Okay, so the, the pain of childbearing was associated with the curse in Genesis 3, okay? Well, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? Well, I actually John? was going to raise my hand, so. Uh, well, so the previous You verse, had that look on your face. <laughs> so the previous verse talks about, well, he's talking about how men are to have authority in the church. He grounds that in the fact that women, a uh, woman came from man, um, but woman is not um, below man now man comes from woman and um, human race comes from a uh, woman so that's a high uh, place in the world and so she's not she's saved not um, with regards to salvation but she's saved from the uh, the idea that man is better than woman okay all right my we need to wrap this up I do want to make a couple of closing comments on this on this verse one is that in Genesis 3, we find not only pain associated with childbearing, we also find redemption associated with childbearing. Okay. It's the seed of the woman. It's through the seed of the woman that God brings salvation into the world. And so 
childbearing is an important part of the, the role that God has given to women in his redemptive purposes. One commentator made an interesting point here, and that is, if men are intended within the church to exercise authority from the top, they're there to be the, the spiritual leaders of the congregation, women have a tremendous amount of spiritual influence exercised from the bottom through raising godly children and the, the, the role that mothers play in raising their children and in pointing them toward Christ is a, a huge aspect of the church's ministry. And this is to be carried out with faith and love and holiness and self-control, the same kind of godliness that is required of men earlier in the chapter is something that, uh, toward which women are appointed as well. Now, I, I know that we didn't give everybody all of the opportunities for comment that we would have liked. We didn't discuss all the issues that we could have discussed. But hopefully this opened some doors, helped a little bit in understanding what is in many ways a very, very difficult chapter. So next week, he's just talked about the responsibility of men providing spiritual leadership, he's going to dig into it when we get to chapter 3. So let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the, the, the demonstration of your wisdom that you have provided in the ways that you have taught your people to live before you and in relationship to one another. It's very easy to be drawn into the, the priorities of the culture, the values of the culture that would turn us away from your word. But we pray that we would remain firmly under the guidance of what you taught us and in so doing demonstrate the value of doing things your way rather than doing things the world's way and thus be a testimony to the surrounding world with all of its false values and dangerous ideas. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.